So someone pointed out that I didn't bother to introduce myself. So my name is Window Snyder. I'm the CSO of Fastly. And uh, <laughs> hi. And uh, one of the other things we, uh, we, we, we talk about internally when we're trying to find great speakers, great talks for you guys, is uh, looking for talks that are operating, um, that are on the, the edge of what most of us are doing on, on a regular basis. So I think this is one of those talks. Yes, we're going to be talking about side channel analysis and fault injection, which uh, there's actually a very small number of people on the planet who are working on that. Um, so we are thrilled and very lucky to have Jasper here with us. So Jasper van Voldenberg. Oh, I got a thumbs up. Sweet. I've been working on my Dutch pronunciation really hard, so that actually means a lot to me. Is uh, the CTO at Riskier, North America. And he's a principal security architect and responsible for their, techni their technical activities. Um, and I found out about him through, through this work. And uh, um, honestly, I, I, uh, I find it fascinating, even though it's nothing, nowhere near anything that I'm working on. But that's why we do this stuff, because we just love it, right? So um, fantastic. Uh, please welcome Jasper. Thanks for the intro, window. Um, yeah, so I'm working at the, uh, at literally at the edge usually, because I'm working on physical devices that you can actually touch and that are not living in some virtual, uh, virtual space. Am I too tall? <laughs> oh, that's a good sound. That was my back, just stretching out. Um, so I do, uh, I do hardware attacks for, for a living. Uh, I work for a company called Riskier, and we operate basically in the embedded space uh, uh, on the offense side. So people come to us with their mobile phones or their IoT device or their settle box, and uh, we try to establish what the security of that thing is. And yeah, two things that we, I mean, we also do firmware attacks and network attacks, but that would bore you, right? Because you know that stuff. So I'm going to be talking about side channel analysis and fault uh, attacks, which are actually uh, physical attacks on, uh, on the device. Does this thing work? Awesome. So I was looking actually for uh, maybe just a quick round so I know where you guys stand. Who, who knows what fault injection attacks are? And oh, wow, a side channel attacks? Oh, why am I here? <laughs> ask, me, ask me difficult questions by the end then. So uh, fault injection, I was actually looking for some interesting examples here. And I found um, you guys may have played with uh, pinball machines before. This is a really old one with uh, basically nails sticking out. And at some point, they started to introduce a scoring system and also a way to win coins if you, if you did really well. And at that point, it became interesting for attackers to play with this system a little bit. So one of the things that you know is you can bang this thing around to get the ball into the place where you want. So early uh, um, pinball machine developers actually thought of fault injection countermeasures, which is the, uh, the, uh, the tilt sensor that's actually invented in the 1930s. And it's actually kind of an interesting parallel to what we do. Um, so we are, and I'll go more into the details in a bit, but we're basically hitting devices as hard as we can, and there's all kinds of sensors to try to prevent us from, from doing that. But this was way before my time, already uh, a game, apparently. So on the, on the, the side channel side, I don't know if you guys know this, uh, this example. It's the, the pizza attack. Anybody heard of the pizza attack? Yeah, I see a few nods. It's actually a really interesting side channel. Um, so um, th these are the, the pizza deliveries around the time of the um, end of July 1990. And all of a sudden, one day later, there was a huge amount of pizzas that was being ordered just around the pizza places around the Pentagon. Anybody know this, uh, this date? Exactly, that was the invasion of Kuwait. So there was actually an interesting side, and the, the next day there were there as well. There's actually an interesting side channel here because when you're working late, what do you do? You order pizzas. Why do you work late? Because there's something terrible happening somewhere around the world, right? So just uh, keep count of these, these pizzas around Washington, D.C. if you want to hedge on any wars or things like that. Um, so that's, that's the idea of side channel analysis. And 
you can apply this to full systems, but we're actually going to be focusing right on the, the CPU itself, because that's where the interesting parts are happening. So I'll talk about um, some of these, we call them non-invasive chip attack techniques. Um, invasive means when we actually start decapping parts and going inside and playing with the, with the electronics, which is um, beyond what I'm going to be talking about today. I'll talk a little bit about what this means for your uh, product development and your testing, in case you're doing that, and uh, come with some conclusions. So uh, one thing I've learned, and you all know in security, is you can't make unbreakable things. Um, but you can actually make it, depending on what you call security and what you're trying to prevent against, you can make it secure enough. Um, but let's first talk about the, uh, the attacks. So let's say you are a, a pirate flag sitting on top of my slide and you want to uh, attack an app running on my, uh, my phone. In the olden days, without, this is before code signing and all that kind of stuff, you could just directly inject code into the app and you were done. So the OS guys came in and they were like, well, maybe we should start signing some code. So they started signing apps, and at that point you can't change the app anymore, uh, but you can attack the OS. So this is really where, and we were talking about secure boot a little bit in the previous talk as well, but um, you, saw that you see that the root of trust has moved to hardware. So in the flash, there's actually some uh, flash load or which then verifies the signature of the OS. Uh, which then verifies the signature of the app on your phone. Um, but Flash is really easy to attack. So I don't know if you guys have ever, especially if it's sitting in a big chip like that, you can just desolder it, read it out, change it, and you're done. So to make that even harder, this is historically what, uh, what we've been seeing, is they actually start putting um, key material inside the ROM of a chip. So a ROM is read-only memory, hard to change without opening up the package and doing physical attacks there. And you can actually embed a public key in there, which then will check the image of the flash, which then will check the image of the OS, which then will check the image of the application. So you have a whole route of trust going back into hardware, which supposedly keeps your uh, firmware images authentic, or all your code authentic, actually. So that's what we have. Now, on the other hand, we have faults. And I'm going to define that a little bit further. So um, faults cause some kind of malfunction on the chip. Um, but we don't just want any malfunction as an attacker. I mean, we can crash a chip, which is not very interesting, especially since we're talking about physical access. It's really easy to crash anything if you just grab a big hammer and hit it, right? But that's not interesting from, a denial, or from, a, from an attacker point of view. So what we're looking for is some kind of temporary fault and preferably something small. And with small, I mean, maybe a couple of bit flips here and there, maybe an instruction that doesn't execute properly, something on that, that scale. Um, and there's multiple ways we can do that. So one of the ways is to do um, what we call voltage fault injection. And it's actually, once you have a chip and you have the PCB, you actually can control the, volt, the supply line to that chip. So, what we do a lot in our lab is we peel off the supply line in the PCB, we take a lab power supply, we power it ourselves, hope to think it still works. Um, usually it does, it's not so hard. Um, but then you're under control of the power. And that actually gives you an interesting knob to turn because you can uh, drop the power at any time you want. And you can also drop the power for a very short amount of time. And what not everybody knows is that um, Obviously, if you drop the power for a very long time, you just get a reset. You know, that's what you do with the off button on your machine as well. But if this goes into you know, the, the, the microsecond, nanosecond range, um, you may actually cause some of these faults. So what this um, excellent graph is showing you is um, you know uh, when you go down to CPU architecture, um, inside a CPU there's all kinds of registers and there's buses between these registers. And this whole thing consumes power. So what happens if right when I'm trying to pull a value from one register, I just drop the power just slightly and very shortly? I may actually read the wrong value because there's no power. It could be a logic zero if that's how you represent things. Whereas there might have 
being just a logic one on the other end. So we can flip in very short amounts of time, we can flip these bits. And I'll get into later why that's a problem. Um, another thing we can do in, on some embedded systems, not all of them, um, is to control the clock. So there's an external oscillator typically that, that generates a square wave, which um, makes is, is a clock input to the device. Um, you can play with this as well. So again, just like power, you scrape off the original clock line, you insert your own, and you can just generate arbitrary waveforms on there, um, which is a lot of fun because um, these chips, they operate on this clock, right? So they do an instruction fetch, and they do a decode, and an execute, and a write back. Um, but if you introduce a very fast clock, you're actually making sure that the chip doesn't fully complete that phase. So it may, for instance, not do the write back of the instruction result, or maybe it fetches um, something and it doesn't decode the opcode properly. So you can cause all kinds of in interesting effects there. Now I have to say a lot of, um, we don't do this a lot anymore because most chips nowadays have a lot of PLLs on the, on the board itself or they actually generate the clock inside the chip itself so there's no physical wire. But on some uh, earlier microcontrollers or simple microcontrollers, this is still a very viable uh, means of playing with things. Um, this is where it gets cool. Um, this is something we've now been doing, this is more one of the more recent techniques that we've been doing, I think three, four years now. Uh, and it's actually playing with EM pulses. And the nice thing with uh, EM pulses is you don't need to change anything on the PCB. So before I had to take my power line or my clock line, now I basically put a coil over the chip, I blast it with redonkulous amounts of energy, and hope I, fl I flip a few bits. Um, and it's actually really nice because the previous two attacks target the entire chip, whereas now I have locality. So in lots of modern chips, you'll have crypto accelerators, you'll have maybe multiple CPUs and decoders and who knows what. Um, and you can pick them by positioning your probe over it and then blasting it. Question? So the question here is um, whether I am referring to a laser uh, uh, attack on a particular part of the substrate or just a blast of energy. Uh, this slide blast of energy, next slide laser. So <laughs> um, no, so here it's, it's purely uh, non-invasive. So we really just make a coil, which these are our prototype coils now. They're all nicely productified, but this is just handmade stuff that you can make at home as well. Um, I believe we're blasting a couple hundred volts at uh, a few tens of amperes for a very short time, because otherwise you get lots of burning smells in your lab. But you basically generate a large pulse and uh, that will induce currents on the chip, and those currents will also glitch uh, or flip bits, basically. So lots of fun here. Um, so as promised, my lasers. Um, Lasers actually have an interesting history because um, they are actually coming, a, a lot of these techniques are coming from failure analysis. Do you guys know what failure analysis is? So that's when, um, when you have chips that are coming from a fab and they fail for some reason. And there can be all kinds of fabrication, you know, bugs basically that you need to analyze and fix. So um, you can have um, for this, um, um, you can, yeah, I, actually I'm not a failure analysis expert, but basically what you can do is you can try to debug and figure out what went wrong during the fabrication of a chip. But a lot of these tools, they're so nicely yet, you know, manipulating chips that you can use them as an attacker as well. Go ahead. So basically for any failed chip, it's basically an inverse problem to figure out what went wrong with it? So the question is if um, uh, for any failed chip, it's an inverse process to figure out what went wrong uh, with it. So. Um, I don't know if it's an, in, you mean an inverse process to attacking it, right? I mean an inverse problem because you don't know what's wrong with it. All you know is it's faulty with it. So you have to figure out what went wrong. Yeah, yeah, so it, it is basically figure out, debugging what went wrong in the fabrication. Um, Which is also 
also a gate towards vulnerability. Is that what you're getting at? No, it's actually production failures. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, lasers were actually um, um, introduced in the 70s, I think, when they started shooting chips up into space, which are harsh radiation environments. Um, and back then, I think they still do this a lot, but you, you expose these chips to harsh radiation environments on the ground to just figure out how they would do up there. But it turns out harsh radiation environments are not so compatible with humans. So it's easier to get one of these lasers in your lab. And it actually kind of simulates the same effects on a chip as alpha particles or gamma rays or things like that. Um, and one of the nice things about lasers compared to all the other attacks is that now I get an even smaller um, area that I can target. And I can do it very fast. So if you take a modern diode laser, you can switch it at you know, 20 megahertz or something like that. Is this on DCAP chips or is it on? So the question is, is this on DCAP chips? Uh, yes. So um, I'm going a little bit off track on my non-invasive here. But what you basically need um, is either access to the front side of the chip, so that's where you see all the wires. And the other way you can do it, and it depends a bit on what the chip is like, you can also do a backside attack. So if you know how chips are made, there's, they're basically a sandwich, right? Or, or a hamburger, I guess we're in the US. So you have a, a, a base substrate, which is basically silicon. Then you have the actual um, silicon, or the, sorry, the, the semiconductor layer, and then you have where all the gates are, and they have all the wires in multiple metal layers on top that connect all the gates together. So we can shoot from the top, where we try to bounce photons through these metal layers, or we can shoot from the backside, where we, um, <laughs> that's what she said, uh, or <laughs> where you go through the substrate and you try to hit uh, the gates from the, um, <coughs> from that other side. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> um, now we, um, we designed this with a, well, we have a 20 watt laser, which is an insane amount of power to put on a six by 1.4 micron space. It's a little bit over-designed, I think, but it, the, the goal was to go through the substrate, which is, which is not super transparent. Um, anyway, it's cool to brag about what, what, well, in this group, it's cool to brag about it. Um, this, for the backside, we're using 1064 nanometers, which is in the near infrared. And from the front side, we're uh, doing red or blue, and I forget the blue one, but the red is 808 nanometers. Another question. So the question is, um, yeah. So the the question is, why are you not explaining what infrared is uh, used for? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the reason why we're using infrared. So thanks for the question. So. The reason we're using <laughs> the reason we're using infrared is silicon is transparent to it. So when you look at the backside of a chip, it actually looks like glassy, but not transparent to the naked eye. But once you get into the infrared, it actually just becomes fully transparent. I didn't bring these pictures, but there's really cool shots that you can make if you illuminate a chip from the backside with um, IR, because you can basically see through the back backs. Uh, sorry, through the substrate as if it's glass. So for infrared, it just penetrates through there, but there's actually a problem there because the layer where we want the photon to be absorbed is also silicon and therefore also transparent. So that's why we get to these redonkulous powers because you need to get through that substrate, which is what you do with the 1064 nanometers, and then you still need to cause some kind of effect. So we just blow up the power to make sure that something will happen there. Um, so yeah, but basically what we're doing is we're, we're hitting a chip with a, with a Fulton tech hammer. Like th this is very blind attacks typically. Like we don't know much about the chip. Um, so a lot of it is also dependent on just hitting it and seeing what happens. Um, but you can see all kinds of interesting things. So you can um, see data corruptions come by. Um, which can be cool if you're doing you know, key material and you can zero out a key or something like that. Great, you're in. Um, a really um, 
basic one actually, so I haven't even talked about it, but um, on PCBs, you can pull address lines. So if you have address and data bus going to memory, you can play with those. Um, so if you're, if you're wrongly in, um, implementing a secure boot, for instance, let's say you have a big flash memory there, right? And the first thing you do is your ROM loader comes up and it verifies it's an eight megabyte flash, but the code is only one megabyte, so we verify the first megabyte. Okay, signature's correct. And then you jump into that code and execute it. Sounds very sane, but not a good idea because I am there with my address line attack. So I control this flash. I don't know the signing key, so I cannot spoof the signature. But what I do is I have this eight megabyte block of data. I just copy that first megabyte over to the four megabyte mark. I modify the code as I wish. And what you now do is you wait for this firmer signature verification to finish. Then you pull the address line because the ROM loader still thinks it's going to jump at the entry point of the blob that it verified, but I actually pu pulled the high order bit, which makes it go into my attack firmware. And then I'm in. So the, the fix is, of course, is to copy the flash into an internal SRAM or something like that and verify it there. Because an internal SRAM is, an internal, I mean, inside the chip package, it's much harder to attack than anything on the, in the PCB side. Um, another thing that we see actually a lot is um, it's I would call it effectively instruction skipping. Um, so you actually see that once you hit a particular instruction, so you always have to time this a little bit, but you hit a particular instruction, it doesn't execute as it should. And, well, often you can get corruptions. Um, but in my example that's coming up, you can actually do some more interesting things. So I'll get into that into a sec in, in, in a second. Um, if you want to read more about how these things are actually done in practice, so that the PS3 hypervisor was hacked by an address line attack. Or an, maybe not an address line attack, but it was corrupting the memory bus between the SOC and uh, the chip itself. And the, the 360 was actually hacked with a reset glitch. So it was actually a short glitch on the reset line which made the um, comparison of the firmware hash always return true, no matter what hash you loaded. Question? With that sort of glitch, uh, can you do me any good? Is that similar to uh, Game Genie? What do you mean? Oh, yeah, so the game, if, if I remember correctly, that's something that you put in between your ROM and your device. Um, no, so I would consider that a logical attack. So you basically, actually use the proper communication channel, but it's just, you're a man in the middle, really between the game and the, and the target. Um, these are side channel attacks, so you're not using it to really drive the logic, but it's similar. Yeah. So another question, Eric? As far as I know, just um, uh, pirates, basically, or reverse engineers, and they <laughs> they use this to do get a um, a corruption in some of the memory tables, so they could start dumping the uh, the OS. And from from that moment on, it was all software attacks. But the first kind of way in was a hardware attack, which is interestingly actually what you get once you increase software security. For some reason, attackers go to hardware secure. Uh, hardware attacks. It works magically. Um, so I'm going to give you guys one example to keep you awake. And also bonus points for the guy who finds the bug in my, what is it, eight lines of code? <laughs> so this is a C, uh, C program which checks whether the pin that I, uh, I entered on the command line is one, two, three, four. And then it says pin accepted or it says pin rejected. So it's very simple, but I just want to show you the reverse engineer or the Sorry, the, eh, the disassembly of this, so you can spot where to do the fault injection. Anybody see the bug? It, uh, there's no arguments. Uh, okay, there's two bugs. So apparently there's one <laughs> if there's no argument. Arcv0 is always set. Thank you. Arcv0 is actually the name of the program. That's very correct. But it's, it's 
you were actually looking at RQ1, and there's an argument. Yeah, yeah if I was looking at RQ1, you get a null pointer or something like that, right? Yeah. Anyway, this is a one slide. Uh, I don't, I'm an attacker. Don't make me code stuff. <laughs> um, so if you disassemble this, um, you see this nice um, conditional branch instruction. And that's the ones that we really like when we're doing false injection. Because remember I was saying about instruction corruption? This is where I would corrupt it. Because as you can see, you first get this test instruction, which is a return from the string comparison. And then if it says uh, one, it will actually fall through the jump and say pin accepted. If the comparison returns zero, it will jump to the pin rejected and print that stuff out. So I actually have a single point of failure here. So if I'm able to corrupt this instruction in any way, I will probably just say pin accepted and, and continue. Um, so this is why we like, we like conditional branches as, um, as attackers. Um, now, how do I, this, this is of course what you're all asking yourself, how do I know when to glitch this? Do I need to disassembly? Do I need to know exactly what chip architecture all this stuff is? And the answer is obviously no. Uh, we're lazy, so we don't want to figure all that stuff out. So a lot of it is just hitting it till it does what we want. <laughs> it's not a good relationship tool. It works very well with false injection. Um, so one of the things that we, uh, sorry, question. So I'm getting a, a good question here, I'll, I'll repeat it. So the question is I'm attacking a one megabyte flash and there's a two byte instruction somewhere, that's the one that I need. How are you even gonna find this? Which is a very good question. Um, and I haven't talked about side channel analysis yet, but I'll give you a little preview of what we do. And actually I'll put it in context directly of the secure boot that I was talking about earlier. Secure boot, it's this, this basically you do an RSA signature verification and then you verify whether it's correct or incorrect. Sounds like a conditional jump? It is. So that's the one that we want to target. But how do we know when it happens? Um, this is actually trivially easy. We hook up a, um, an oscilloscope to the device. That's all we do. We start it and we take a power trace. And again, I'm flash forwarding to my other presentation or the other half, but you basically get a profile which depends on the, ex the basically the, the instructions being executed. And it's pretty clear on what's happening. So you do this for the first second or so of a device until you know that it's booted. Then I flip one bit in the firmware and I do exactly the same. That power profile is going to say, show in the beginning exactly the same kind of profile because it's, you know, it's loading the firmware, it's calculating the hash, and then by the end of it, it's going to uh, make a conditional decision saying this flash is incorrect. And from that moment on, the behavior completely changes. So my power profile also completely changes. So just from these two traces, I know exactly at 0 0.85346 seconds after I power the device on, that's where the conditional branch is being done. So I don't need to search through this entire space. I just take a side channel and just hit it right. How many minutes do I have? <laughs> 10, I think. OK, so we basically fuzz when we're trying to figure out the parameters to this, but we do it with actual hardware because we can usually just power it, cycle it, and then we have a clean slate again, and we just rinse and repeat. And we can use these techniques of like differential power analysis to look at where things start to differ. That's not interesting. Um, well, you guys all have this. I think this is just to, um, <laughs> just to prove that I'm not just talking theory here, but this actually exists, and it's being monetized by, uh, by some groups out there. Um, so just to kind of give you an idea of the, the game of faults that we're playing here. So 99% um, of the time we crash everything, but it's that 1% that we're really, really looking for. Um, and the, the, really the strategy for an attacker here is to try to come up with more precise tools to hit exactly that one thing that you, that you want to hit. Um, and with a defender, it's really to put up as many hurdles as, as you can to make me give up, 
right? So you can think of all kinds of things like randomizing the timing. So even though I know it happens at 8.59 sec seconds, the next time it won't because the, there's a random delay loop or something like that. Um, you can also, and, and secure chips have this, they actually have detectors on, in the hardware itself um, that detect voltage drops, that are light sensors, there's all kinds of things that you can trap and then you can have a tamper response to that. So these are really chips that are defending themselves against these, uh, these attacks. Um, the main target we're seeing for false injection is this secure boot just because basically the whole security of the system relies on it. When anything comes up, the first thing it does is it checks its firmware and it does all kinds of secure configuration. If you can beat that, then you're in. Um, and also, because you guys are more into software, um, buffer overflows, right? Each buffer gets length checked, right? So we can glitch that. <laughs> so then you just, Put your payload in there and you're, it's party like 1999 again. Um, literally. literally, yes. Okay, so I'm going to race through side channel analysis, which is great because you guys already knew it from, from, from what I saw on the hands before. Um, so the idea is we're going to be observing the signals that are coming out of a system without really trying to affect the system itself. Um, and there's a whole bunch of side channels that you can think of. Uh, it can be the timing that some critical operation takes. Uh, it can be the power consumption of a device. It can be EM radiating from a device. Um, light emissions even. Oh, really? I got a time extension. I hope you guys are, uh, aren't expected home at any time soon. I got 35 extra minutes, so I'm gonna just take my normal pace again. Um, so, Light emissions, <laughs> no. So there is actually light em em being emitted from your chip. You can't see it, but if you decap a chip and you put, and this is infrared, so you put an infrared sensitive camera over there, there's actually some small probability that when a transistor switches, it actually emits a photon. So you can see the active areas on a die, and this is really awesome, it's like a city at night kind of thing, but it's also a side channel. If I'm running hev heavily the crypto, I can see where the crypto engine is lighting up, right? So that it's really nice to, uh, to do. Um, sound, believe it or not, I'm not talking about your 8-bit sound blaster here, I'm talking about actually if you have a chip, this is a research from um, Shamir, famous cryptographer a couple years ago. He actually showed that if you're running, uh, I think it was new PG he was going for, um, but basically the decoupling capacitors around your chip, they vibrate a little bit, depending on the, the power load on the, on the chip itself. So you actually have a relation between the power consumption and these vibrations. And you just use the microphone to pick it up. And you can actually listen in to chips. It's high pitched, you don't hear it yourself, but you can listen into this and start figuring out what's, what's going on. And he used it to extract, uh, I believe it was ECC uh, keys. So, cool stuff. Um, so when any of these side channels are related or correlated to a um, security operation, it can compromise the system. It's mostly on crypto though. Um, I certainly hope that first bullet is, is clear to you guys. Semiconductors use power. So, but it's actually when transistors are switching, that's when the power is being consumed, because there's actually a short amount of time that you get some current flow between ground and VCC, and that adds up. So all these little transistors that are switching adds up to the full power profile of, uh, of a chip. And if you hook it up to an oscilloscope, this is kind of the typical profile of one clock cycle. So in the beginning, you see a lot of transistors switching, and then it dies out until the next clock cycle hits again, and then you see this. So you see this kind of spiky pattern at the frequency of the clock. Um, but it's, there's, there's a really important thing here, which is that transistor don't just switch because they like to. They're switching because they're doing something. And if what they're doing is related to some secret, then all of a sudden that secret is now related to the power, right? So our game is to look at the power and figure out what that secret was. Um, 
So this is how we, uh, how we do that. That's one of the ways how we do this. So again, you can cut the power supply to a chip and you just basically put, we call it a current probe, but you're basically measuring the power of the instantaneous power consumption of this device over time. So you get this nice profile with all these spikes. Uh, FLOR is not interesting, so let's skip this. Uh, another way of doing this is um, using an electromagnetic probe. So as you guys all know from high school physics is that when a, a device is consuming power, there's also a field that it generates. And this field we can measure. So what we basically do, it sounds all cool EM pro, but it's basically a very small coil that we put over the chip, hook it up to an oscilloscope, and we can see the field change over that chip. Um, the nice thing with EM is, just like uh, with, with EM fault injection in the fault injection side, is we can pinpoint this to a specific part of the chip. So we can, again, figure out where crypto accelerators are. So one of the tricks that we use is, um, typically these devices have different uh, clock domains. So you can just start sampling these traces over different places on the chip, and you just do a simple frequency analysis. Often in the data, data um, sheet, you can find, hey, the crypto is running at 100 megahertz, and the main CPU is running at uh, 800 gigahertz, whatever. And then you just do a frequency analysis, and you just figure out where this 100 megahertz all of a sudden spikes. Because remember, you have that nice spiky pattern at the clock frequency, you can pick it up. So that way we can just position our probe over the area of interest. Um, so this is your, uh, your very first um, exercise. So here we have a, um, a pin verification running on a target. So remember my little example, this is basically doing that compare between a, a pin that's known and secret in the device and a pin that's input by the user to unlock functionality X. So we're actually feeding this, as an attacker, different pin values. So we're trying to try to get into this device. And what we see is this. I don't know if it's super clear to you guys, but um, does this thing have a pointer also? It does. <coughs> Lasers. How does it work? I'm not good with technology. Ta-da. So, I'm gonna fold the laptop. Um, what you're actually seeing is, and this is just a test setup, so we, we secretly know the key, but uh, the pin. What you're actually seeing is that if we input a pin with an error in the first digit, we get one bump. If we do it with an error in the second digit, we get two bumps. Three digits, three bumps. Four digits, four bumps. So, pop quiz. Huh. If this is C, what function is this developer using to compare the input pin code to the actual pin code? Am I hearing it? Memcomp? String comp? It doesn't matter, both are good answers. <laughs> it's not constant in time, exactly, because memcomp and stream comp are optimized for performance, which is generally a good idea. So they terminate as soon as they find a difference in the two strings that they uh, are comparing. But they are leaking some very critical information. Namely, at what point, in this case, at what point did I enter the wrong digit in my input pin code? Now, obviously you're not getting the pin code out of this directly. But let's say we have uh, four digits from zero to nine. So normally that's 10,000 possibilities, right? So now I have this side channel information where I can take a trace and I can figure out at what digit I, I got it wrong. Now what's the maximum amount of attempts that I need to do? 40. 40 is the correct answer. You go for the next round. So 40, because now I know, so I first, and this is worst case, right? So I first feed it the first digit, the 10 possibilities, and I figure out which one is the right one. Then I do it on the second. 10 times, third 10 times, fourth 10 times. So I get 40 in total. So, of course, you can never enter more than three before the device locks, but the probability of me breaking this has gone from three over 10,000 to three over 40, which if I have a bunch of devices to get into, 
time game. So that, this is just a really simple example of, of what this kind of leakage can tell you. Wow, with the red boxes. Um, I already went in this a little bit, but um, when I'm doing these EM scans, I'm basically taking one of these power traces at each location. But because I don't have um, 4D technology yet, I'm not, or 3D, I guess it would be. Um, each dot here is uh, one full trace, but then we represent it as the spectral energy in a certain frequency band. So we can say, hey, um, the dot here just represents, you can see that here is a bandpass filter. So the energy in this trace between 80 and 90 megahertz. So if we know that the crypto cores are running at 100 megahertz, we set this to 90 to 110, and we get a nice red hot spot of where we want to put our probe. And then the next step is we put our stage over that thing and start measuring at that point only. So let's break some crypto. What you're seeing here is a trace of an uh, RSA execution. Who is uh, familiar with RSA? Who knows the textbook RSA um, multiplication? Or exponentiation, I should say. Hit a one finger, good. Don't use the textbook RSA. Um, what it actually does is, in a nutshell, it basically takes the private exponent which is the thing that you want to keep private, hence the name. And it loops over each individual bit. And when the bit is set to zero, it uh, executes a squaring operation. And when the bit is set to one, it executes a multiplication and then followed by a square, which is a great way to leak your keys. Um, as you can actually see here, I don't know if somebody has a keen eye for traces, but do you see how this thing is leaking that information? So what you want to be looking for is um, the spacing between these dips. So what's actually happening is, and that's for reasons, I had 35 minutes, right? Um, In, an, in a nutshell, what happens is you have a main CPU and you have a crypto accelerator. So RSA works on large numbers, like 1024, 2048 bits. So what you need is very wide multipliers to do this, if you want to do it fast in an embedded system. So that's typically separate hardware from the main CPU. But the main CPU is driving this. So those multiplications and those squares are going to be run on the dedicated accelerators. But all the logic in between, the looping and getting these bits, is on the main CPU. Now, 1,024-bit switching is a lot more energy than a tiny CPU running somewhere. So what you're seeing is in between these accelerator activities, you see a dip, which is basically just the CPU doing whatever it's doing, fetching the next bit, looping, that kind of stuff. But yeah, the problem is if you're doing, like you mentioned here, if you're just doing a square, that's going to be faster than a square and a multiply. So just by looking at the distance between these peaks, we can see what are the squares and what are the square multiplies. And because we know textbook RSA has a one-to-one -one relation between the bits of the exponent and the operation being executed, we can basically read out the key. Simple as that. Um, so this is, yeah, this is always a, a fun moment for us if we see that. On, on modern, so there's a, maybe as a side note, so there's a wide range of very insecure to actually pretty secure chips out there. So any modern smart card, like here in the US, we're getting these bank cards with a chip on it, it's going to be tough to break. Like those things have been tested for all these kind of uh, things. So it's just modus operandi of banks to, to do this kind of stuff. Um, on lower end chips or any form microcontroller that doesn't stamp themselves as secure, yeah, you can see all kinds of these cool things. So we're very excited for the IoT to come. That's going to be, <laughs> we're going to be busy. Um, I'm um, going to spend just a little bit of time on differential power analysis because this is um, rather heavy on the, the statistics and the math. Um, 
And it's one of those things where for the first hour when I'm explaining it, you're like, oh yeah, I get this. And then you get into this huge crash of like, what the hell? And then it takes one more day to recover and then, then you get it. It's a very multi-dimensional problem. But let me just stick to the highlights here. So we know power consumption is related to the operations. Good. Now let's look at a symmetric algorithm. I mentioned triple DES here because, because reasons. But AES, uh, this also holds. Um, what you see on, um, on typical microcontrollers is that the leakage is related to the hemming weight of data. So the hemming weight is just the number of bits set to one in a particular word. Now, out of this mess, it's difficult to read out the key itself. So we're talking about a symmetric algorithm, so we want to hit the key. Um, this is a lot of data. This can be you know, hundreds to hundreds of um, um, millions of samples, uh, traces, I mean. So we take a lot of these things with different input data. Um, we get a lot of points, so we need to apply some kind of statistics to, in order to actually figure out where, um, where interesting leakage is happening. So the one thing that we do is if we know that intermediate states are leaking Hamming weights, we can model intermediate states. So let's say we have an AES algorithm. So we can feed it the plain text. It does some operations with a secret key and then outputs the ciphertext. But these algorithms, they are not big lookup tables. So what actually happens is they cut up the key space into much smaller pieces. If you're familiar with AES, uh, the AES128 has a 128-bit key, but it actually breaks it up into 8-bit chunks. And each of these eight bits goes into an individual S box and through a ship and a mix and all the other AES stuff. Um, but that's where we're going to exploit. So the fact that this key is chopped into little pieces gives us the following advantage. We can actually brute force it using power attacks. So an eight bit brute force I can do on a piece of paper, right? What we're going to do, God, I'm hat waving a lot. This is like an hour of lecture normally. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume that for a particular sub key, the value is zero. And then we're going to calculate, okay, if, if the key indeed was zero, then the power or the value after um, that key addition that's being processed must be a certain value. And because we know it leaks Hamming distance or Hamming weight, we know that the power consumption must be X. And now we're going to look at our traces and we're going to verify whether the power consumption actually was X or not. If it's X, great. K equals zero was the key for that subkey. If it's not, we do it again with K equals one. And we do again the simulation. We calculate the power consumption that we would think we would see. We correlate it to what we actually measured. And again, we can verify whether the key is correct or not. So we're actually doing a brute force on just eight bits of the key at, at one time using the power information. So um, yeah, very powerful stuff and it involves a lot of correlations and a lot of matrices and things, but that's, that's really the gist of it. Um, I'll show you a little bit what it looks like. So I'm zooming in here. This, this is actually that triple DES implementation. And we're just zooming in in the beginning somewhere. Here you see that spiky pattern of the individual clock cycles and the power consumption. And oops, if I go even further, you can see here something interesting. So this is um, traces that are generated with different plain texts. So I'm sending it random data. And what I'm seeing is that in some places, this power consumption is very constant and the same. But in other places, it's really the kind of splitting apart. Well, the only thing I change is the input data. So something must be going on here that's related to this input data. And if this is one of those intermediate stages after a key addition, I can use my DPA to attack this because I predict what the value is going to be. And then I can just do the brute force on the subkeys. Um, now obviously, oops. Um, It l sounds much more complicated if I say we predict the power uses of the, the, the chip. But it's actually not that complicated. 
um, because we the Hemingway that I mentioned, we're not going to go into all kinds of spy simulations and the the, the power consumption of individual gates and then accumulate that because we don't have that knowledge of what that chip looks like. We're actually using a very simple model, which is Hemming weight of data. So if you think there's a data value on the bus that's um, one, then Hemming weight is one. That's our power. If the Hemming weight is eight, then eight is our power. And that makes absolutely no sense in a world where you're actually trying to accurately predict the power. But from a leakage perspective, it's good enough because what we do is we take this value of, you know, Hemming weights and we run just Pearson correlation, which is high school correlation that you learn in school. And that actually is a good enough model to extract these leakage points. So it's just a fact of CMOS. Now, this is on a simple microcontroller. So it's basically just doing the crypto at the moment that we're running it. So on any modern CPU, you can imagine, I think there were a few Dutch people in the crowd that will, will recognize this. This is um, an annual celebration. Um, it used to be called Queen's Day, now it's King's Day. Uh, and it's basically very loud. So there's a lot of people together and they're making a lot of sound. And that guy in there just happens to mumble the key to himself. So our, this, is, this is a representation of an SOC. So there's a lot of noise going on and we just need to pick up what that guy over there is mumbling. Um, it's actually the same technique. So we're still using that Pearson correlation because what it does, it has a natural um, uh, built-in property that it, it kills noise. If I take many, many, many traces, so many and many of these examples of power consumption versus plain text, noise will average out. So I basically consider all that other activity on the chip, I consider it noise. And I just kind of hope that my, my probe is over that guy to sort of listen in on him. Um, we do a bunch of signal processing as well. Um, so spectral filtering, focusing on certain bands uh, in the spectral domain, uh, averaging. So I think the latest numbers we've gone up to a billion or so encryptions that we run on a chip and then we average all that stuff in order to get the key out. So y y we're not talking about uh, um, nano volts of leakage here, it's much smaller. But we can zoom in on that basically by running these correlations. Um, but as a defender you can do all kinds of stuff as well because um, what you saw in this nice picture here is all these traces are nicely what we call aligned. So the process, exactly when the data is leaking, it's in one point in time. If I start mucking up the alignment, those correlations also will suffer. Um, then of course we come along and we try to realign everything by pattern matching, but then a defender is actually just increasing the noise even more, so I don't have a pattern to grasp on and align. So this is actually really just a game of iteratively trying new filters and trying to align and get noise out until you find that one thread that you pull the entire shirt apart. Um, there's also all kinds of cool crypto tricks that you can use um, by blinding, which is um, basically randomly adding values into the crypto algorithm in such a way that the output is still the same, but all the intermediate values actually randomly changed. Because if I can't predict the intermediate value with my Hemingway model anymore, I can't correlate either. So this is a really cool thing. Very expensive to do performance-wise, but it's possible. Um, so a little bit on, on some, uh, some countermeasures. So you guys know that you actually need to um, have some kind of se secure boot if you want to initialize your trusted computing base uh, correctly. I was actually surprised from the previous talk that so in my world, in the embedded space, where anything is somewhat secure, you have secure boot. It's just there. Um, so I was a little surprised that in the server world this um, hasn't percolated all the way yet. Um, yeah, cryptography is, is a key component in, in any of these functions, so including the, the secure boot. So FI basically threatens uh, secure boot and crypto. Uh, SCA mostly threatens crypto. So we're just attacking cryptographic algorithms almost uh, always. Um, but it's always good to realize that we're doing these attacks on systems where we are 
physically close, with a few exceptions. I'll get to that later. Um, for each of the attacks that I have just explained, there's another countermeasure, and then there's another attack, and then there's another countermeasure. This has been going on since the late 90s or so, at least in the public, public space. So there's a lot of, um, besides what I just explained, it goes on and on and on. Um, and it becomes, at least for the people who, who make products, it becomes an interesting balancing act between how much um, silicon do I have, how, what's my power budget, what's my speed budget, versus what do I need to do for security. So there's really uh, some, I'm, I'm happy I'm not in that position, but there's really critical trade-offs that you, you need to make um, when you're making a secure system that actually also runs. Um, just to give you an idea of what the costs of these attacks are, and this is just from our typical engagements. So for fault injection, we're usually between one and four weeks for a, simple for a single test, I should say. Side channel analysis, two to 12 weeks. Um, and that's for identification. So I always like to split these up. So that's going from basically little to zero knowledge to breaking the system the first time. And then exploitation is, okay, I know how to break one system, how can I now break the next system? Because there's, there's a really difference between software and hardware there. Because on software, exploitation cost is usually zero. Right? I just, once I have my exploit, I just run it on all these systems and I'm done. I need physical access, so that's, that's already a first uh, problem in scaling all these things. Um, also, if I happen to know where the leakage is, it doesn't mean that I can immediately extract the key. Maybe I still have to take that billion traces on the next device as well in order to get the key out. So um, there's really a the defender's advantage there uh, as well. Um, on the side of the equipment cost, it doesn't have to be that expensive. So if you see on the low end, I'm putting $500 there. You need some glitching equipment, and you need some EM coils, and maybe a, a cheap oscilloscope. That's a basic setup that you can do this, this kind of stuff with. If you want to go to the high end, yeah, you're talking about a couple hundred thousand dollars worth of, uh, of fun laser equipment. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip this, I think. Well, actually, there's one, there's one thing that's, um, that's really important here as well, which when you look at um, hardware attacks, um, the main difference with software, just if you look at the development cycle, right? Let's say I start making a secure chip at t equals zero. Then maybe one year or two years from now, that chip will actually go into the, into the market. Then it needs to be inside of a device for, well, if it's your mobile phone, two months, I guess. But if it's any other system, uh, two years, uh, electronic passports, 10 years, vehicles, 15, 20 years, and it still needs to be secure. So that's really difficult. One of the, uh, one of the jokes we always have internally is if you give me a chip that's 10 years old, I'll give you the keys tomorrow. Right, so that's the attacker, just because of Moore's law, my scopes get bigger, my memory gets bigger, and my disks get bigger, I can do a lot more of these attacks, whereas that hardware, as soon as it's in the field, pff, stable, not patchable. So that's a difficult problem, and it's a very, very different dynamic from the software world, where you can instantly patch and kind of keep up with your attackers in that way. You had a question? Uh, just real quickly, the setup for Mark, I'm sure that whatever, you know, facility from Taiwan are manufacturing it, it's part of QA, is a Chinese intelligence capturing all these signatures. So, the and they got the so um, supply chain attacks is a whole different interesting world. Yeah, so, yeah, just Google hardware trojans and you'll find lots of interesting uh, things to think about. Question in the back. Would you be confident you could attack a 10 year old uh, multi-channel hardware security module and get the same uh, Yeah, probably, yes. So hardware security modules, so if you're talking about um, like HSMs that banks have and everything, they have some tamper protections, but they're typically designed more to be in enclosed environments. Um, they, they do have some tricky countermeasures sometimes, like tamper mashes and things like that, which I haven't really talked about. It's also not our field of expertise, but um, yeah, all those things uh, have attacks as well. Right. 
Again, I'm going to ask folks to hold your questions till the end. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, I should not have responded. <laughs> <laughs> um, so countermeasures, I think I already talked about a couple of these. So um, it's really about making it just harder for your attacker to grasp onto something. So really make your process non-repeatable, current scrambling, so you can have like things that consume arbitrary power. Uh, you can have algorithmic um, countermeasures, randomizing timing, all that kind of stuff. It's all about just raising, continuously raising that bar. We're not looking for cryptographic security here because we're not going to get it. We just have a crypto algorithm. We need to imp we need to protect the implementation. So it's all about just raising that uh, that bar. Um, and we see, I mean, when we're looking at some really high-end smart cards, um, it really becomes uneconomical to attack these things, right? If I need to employ $200,000 equipment and I can only break your personal bank uh, card within you know, five months of my work, it wasn't probably worth my effort. So this is going back to we can't make it unbreakable, but maybe we can make it secure enough. Um, yeah, I think this is, this is one of the things we see when um, when players are joining this field for the first time, um, they often are like, oh, you're doing that attack? Great, I can do this countermeasure and you will fail. Uh, and it either, uh, either the countermeasure doesn't work as advertised or we just find another attack. So um, this is really, and this is, this is difficult, but you really have to have this cycle of testing of your countermeasures as well and then tuning them, making them, making them increasingly better. Um, so let's go to the conclusions. So this is probably what we were all taught in school, right? Protect your input, protect your output, and then you're done. Um, which, if your thing is living in a server, is probably good enough. But that doesn't work in the embedded space. So you actually need to protect your application at runtime at every point where it's doing critical operations. And this is not trivial at all. Um, but it's good to realize that these kind of attacks exist, and once you start playing with embedded systems, this is what you're going to be susceptible to as well. So, um, yeah, side channel fault injection threaten modern devices that are that are living in the field. So we're hitting secure boot, we're hitting cryptography, but really physical access is required, with the exception of my next slide, and. Um, the security really depends on the countermeasures implemented. If you have no countermeasures, this is really a piece of cake, this stuff. All that $500 equipment I was talking about, it works. Um, of course, these are not the only attacks you can do on an embedded system. Um, you still have the logical attacks and the network attacks to consider as well. But what we see is there's so much that the bar on some, some of, not all systems, but the bar there is going up. And if hardware attacks are just easier for an attacker, that's the way they're gonna go. So I added this, um, this more recently, this slide, because there's actually some interesting things happening where the attacks that we're doing actually apply to uh, wider um, domains, like software. So I don't, who's familiar with white box crypto here? Ooh, I got a hand, awesome. Um, white box crypto is the um, the art almost of protecting keys in a cryptographic implementation which is running in software and you assume that your attacker has full visibility of this software and full controllability of the software as well. Not a trivial problem to solve but it's still being used in some DRM applications, it's being used in payment application and what we're actually doing now is we're taking these white box crypto implementations where the key is normally not visible through reverse engineering or memory dumps, but we plug it into our side channel software and actually the keys just fall out. And that's because it's targeting these intermediate values instead of trying to look for the key itself. And a lot of these white box solutions are just susceptible to this. There's, there's ones that are hard. So some of them take you know two months to break, but we are now starting to um, uh, see a bunch of them also that just break with one click in, in the software. Um, Rowhammer, also really interesting stuff. 
because that's actually fault injection through software means. I don't need to be on the target anymore to flip bits in memory. So, voila. Um, kudos to the, uh, the guys who came up with this. It's really awesome work. Um, I think I just want to, just in interest of time, um, point you guys to the last bullet here. So, um, unfortunately, we as a company don't make all our stuff open source, but if you look at Chip Whisperer, which is Colin O'Flynn's stuff, um, he has open source hardware and software for doing, uh, doing these types of attacks. Um, so you can play around with that, uh, that yourself. So I think we are now at the point where I'm allowed to take questions, right? I'm getting the thumbs up. So shoot, not literally. Or raise your hand and we'll bring the mic to you. Oh, yeah, mic. Um, I was just curious about um, if you could give like uh, some maybe rough numbers on like the locality and efficacy of like the EM fault injection versus the optical fault injection yeah. stuff. So for optical, it's it's pretty clear. So it's like six by one point four micron spot size that we can reach, um, and then it becomes complicated because that's the spot size as soon as it hits like the substrate from the backside or the metal from the front side, and then you get all kinds of scattering effects. So effectively, we're hitting a bigger spot there. With um, our EM coils, the coil itself has a diameter of about a millimeter or so. So you're hitting a much larger area than, um, than you know, the, the laser itself, but still uh, much more constrained than like a full power glitch or, uh, or a VCC glitch. So I don't know the exact numbers, um, we're still hackers in that respect that we just make a coil and it seems to work and good. Can you kind of make the coil like shape it and kind of influence the material? Yeah, there are some, uh, some dip, I don't, I guess I have some pictures here of the, the different coils, which will show up after a lot of patience. Um, if I, there. So you're seeing where you're actually using different core, like, um, Ferro cores inside the coil to shape the fields. And th these are just, um, we can bend them in different ways. We've tried different polarities. So there's all kinds of um, variables that you can play with, which actually sucks as an attacker because this is not easily software controllable, right? So you actually have to make different probes and try it out. And um, yeah, some work, some don't. Question? Any thoughts on the most uh, interesting way to attack the ILS device? Uh, Do you want to repeat that into the microphone? Yes. Sure. Uh, do you have any thoughts on what the most interesting, uh, either glitching or side channel attacks on extracting keys from, uh, like, secure enclave on an iPhone would be? Yeah. So very interesting question. Also, uh, one that we've been pondering with the whole FBI versus Apple uh, going on lately. Uh, I think 50% um, of us have our money on a software attack, and 50% of us have money on our in, on a hardware attack. But a hardware attack. Um, you would basically go the, the, the secure boot route, right? So you have a DFU image, which you can, which, you, know, you can load, but, and, and here's where my knowledge of the Apple system breaks down, but I don't know if that DFU image is um, verified upon flash or, or also on boot. For sure it will be done on boot. Um, if it's only done on boot, you probably have another challenge with firmware encryption because we may be able to glitch the signature verification, but how do you get encrypted correct attacker code on the device? So there, I mean, of course, we can talk about side channel attacks and the decryption of that firmware image. Um, it all sounds rather hard to me. So that's why a lot of us still have money on the software attacks as well. Um, so, I don't, again, I don't know about the specifics on how keys are stored in there, but you can make it really hard to pull keys out. Really hard meaning, yes, you probably have an X percent chance of getting the keys out, but if you have one device and you need to hack that one device, I would not go for an invasive attack because there's just such a big chance you, you burn the only thing that you really were caring about. Hi. Um, there seems to be a large degree of like randomness to these sorts of attacks. So, like, how do you decide like 
whether you do like statistical analysis or what, like how many attacks you try before you decide that you're not getting any useful information and just move to like another spot or another like avenue of attack? That's a very good question. Um, art, experience. That's the best answer I can come up with. So there's, there's, there's a lots of techniques and things that you learn um, when you start doing this and we have guys with a lot of experience who are like, oh, you know, that signal doesn't look good. But if you really start asking why it doesn't look good, it's kind of hard to describe. But yeah, there's, um, there's some basic sets of things that you can apply. Um, but what I find is, uh, and I guess that's with anybody in security, you kind of need to develop a sense of this is where I need to poke at. You know, if you're doing a source code review of a million lines of code, you also can't review it all. So you gotta somehow get some sense of I need to look right there. Um, so I think it's up to now, you know, learn the basics, but after that it's an art form. So I'm an artist. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Any questions? Oh. Just one <laughs> so when you're going after secure boot attacks or when you're trying to develop one, what is, what's the goal, like what the ultimate goal? Is it to productionize this glitching? Is it to retrieve some DRM key? Um, or is someone usually after persistence on a specific device? Good question. I think um, depending on our clients, any of the above. So um, t uh, from a technical point of view, it's basically the earlier you are in boot, the more control you have over the entire platform. Now, if that control means I'm going to extract DRM keys so I can decrypt video, or um, you know, I can plan some malware so that OS query can't see what I'm reading from the firmware. Um, you know, we, I mean, we as a lab, we'll, we'll just do a proof of concept. So we'll glitch it, we'll show, hey, it says hello world. That's not what you programmed in there and then we're good. But usually for our clients, there's a whole um, set of assets that they're trying to protect. And it depends on, on whether they're coming from the financial industry or DRM or any other. Two more questions. Um, kind of like a closing one is, uh, I know you talk about the PS3, and we've heard a lot about satellite TV box hacking, but what are, what are your personal favorites you've seen in the wild attacks, like top highlights, like, oh, that was amazing, and didn't know it could be done, or like, um, yeah. yeah, there's, there's um, so actually, Rowhammer was one of my recent favorites. Uh, because all of a sudden these worlds came together. You know, I personally, I have, a, a, you know, the first five, six years of my professional hacking career was all software. And the last 10 or so were hardware. So it was nice to see, like, hey, wait a minute, these guys are actually doing fault injection, and they're also just using software to do it, and they're exploiting it on the same box as well. So that, I think that was one of my, uh, one of my recent favorites, yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, you mean the stuff that I've seen on the NDA, or? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Can we turn the cameras off? No. <laughs> uh, along those same lines, uh, what are some of the systems that just made you laugh? Like, oh my God, are they are these guys serious? <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I've heard some some horror stories about the uh, public transport chip cards and that sort of yeah. thing. Um, gosh, those are good questions. <laughs> that you can talk about. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, well, what we what we really see in our lab. So I won't disclose details, but we really see this is hard to get right, especially the first time. So, yeah, you'll see a lot of uh, clown countermeasures where you're like, it all looks very fancy, <laughs> but you just go either around it or just in instantly falls down. Um, yeah, I think that's what I can say. <laughs> Anything else? Another Thank big you. hand for Gasper. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.